Hello everyone and welcome to this nanophotonics and plasmodics course. Uh, we're gonna start this course with a brief historical survey of optics, electromagnetism and nanophotonics. So uh, first of all, uh, let's define what nanophotonics uh, and plasmonics are. So nanophotonics is the study of the BAP of light uh, at the nanometer scale and the interaction of uh, light with nanometer scale objects. Plasmonics is just a subfield that focuses specifically on the interaction with uh, the electromagnetic fields from light uh, with the conduction electron in a metal. So in the end, nanophotonics broadly defined is interaction between light and matter at the nanoscale. So uh, with that in mind, uh, we need to actually define what light is and what matter is. So it seems maybe obvious to everyone what light is and what matter is uh, today, but this uh, concept of light and matter evolved over time. So let's start with matter. Around 500 BC, uh, all around the world, from India, China, to Persia, Babylon, and even Greece, the world was actually considered to be built from four elements. So for uh, Empedocles, who was a Greek philosopher introducing these four roots. Uh, there was earth, air, water, and fire. Uh, and this was constituting uh, the world around people. Uh, it took uh, about 100 years uh, for, uh, for another Greek philosopher, uh, Democritus, to introduce the concept of atoms, where he defined uh, these as inert bodies of all shapes. And for, for Democritus, they were an infinite number of atoms, and this was the simplest building block forming matter. Uh, about the same time, uh, Aristotle uh, came back to this definition of uh, classical elements, but he introduced the fifth one, uh, which was uh, ether. Uh, something that also uh, which, which is worth mentioning is that those four elements, earth, water, fire, uh, and air, actually represent the, the four states uh, of matter, where we have earth, solids, water, liquid, uh, air, which is gas, and fire, which is plasma. Uh, René Descartes defined matter as an abstract mathematical substance that occupies space. Uh, so this is something which is very philosophical, but Newton uh, later on actually attributed properties, mechanical and physical properties, to this uh, substance that uh, Descartes introduced. Uh, and then he, he, took the, he took some time until the French Revolution for uh, Antoine Lavoisier to actually introduce the concept of chemical and atomic elements. So Lavoisier introduced uh, 33 elements that were basically forming uh, all matter around us. And this was actually further expanded by uh, Dmitry Mendeleev uh, in 1869 when he introduced this uh, famous uh, periodic table of elements. Uh, and it's uh, only uh, in the 20th century pretty much that uh, J.J. Thompson and Ernest uh, Rutherford uh, determined that uh, atoms were not the, the, the most basic elements of matter, but they were uh, composed of smaller particles uh, that are electrons and protons. So uh, atoms were a collection of charges, positive and negative charges. Uh, and then uh, in the end, when the quantum mechanics came on board, uh, people realized that matter was uh, in fact uh, having a particle wave duality. Now, what about light? Uh, well, light uh, follow the similar pattern. So uh, 500 BC in India, light was actually uh, seen as a high velocity stream of those fire atoms. So if you look at the, those four, four elements, uh, fire was one of these four elements and high velocity stream of those fire elements was forming light. Uh, fairly soon after in, uh, in Greece, uh, a bunch of uh, great mathematicians uh, and philosophers, uh, including Empedocles, Euclid, and Ptolemy, uh, define light uh, and the, the colors we see in around us as an interaction between rays that are being emitted from the eyes and rays that are being from the sun. So uh, around that time, the concept of the interaction uh, from, from light uh, is very important. Uh, Lucretius, uh, back in 55 BC, so this is much, uh, much later on, uh, he was a Roman philosopher, introduced the concept of, uh, of atoms as well for light. Uh, Descartes again, 
based on his work on acoustic uh, waves uh, and defined light as uh, having mechanical properties similar to that of acoustic waves and therefore say that uh, light was actually a wave, a mechanical wave propagating in a certain medium. Uh, the concept of uh, light being a particle or a corpuscule uh, was actually introduced by a French scientist, uh, Pierre Gassendi, uh, and it was uh, further refined and uh, strengthened by uh, Newton himself in the late 17th century. But uh, at the same time, other works uh, pioneered by uh, Robert Hooke and uh, Christian uh, Huygens uh, showed that light was actually behaving as, uh, as a wave. So there were some controversies back at that time between the, the works from Gassendi Newton and the works from Mook and, and Jürgens. Uh, we were actually observing light with uh, under different uh, different behaviors. Uh, and he took the work by uh, Michael Faraday and James Clerk uh, Maxwell uh, back in the, in the second half of the 19th century to actually show that light is not any wave, but is actually an electromagnetic wave composed of electric fields and magnetic fields. And um, similar to matter, uh, the, the birth of quantum mechanics um, led to the discovery of this particular wave behavior of, of light. So for the purpose of, of this course, we're going to actually focus on those two particular definitions uh, that light uh, is indeed a combination of electric fields and magnetic fields, and that matter is a collection of uh, charges, uh, positive and negative charges uh, that are basically electrons and protons. Uh, so let's uh, now look at a little bit of uh, the history of optics, uh, looking at back uh, the ancient times uh, where the first optical devices uh, were actually uh, fabricated. Uh, so those uh, optical devices, mostly lenses, but also some mirrors, uh, can be found uh, and dated back all the way to, to Egypt, uh, 2500 BC. Uh, where in, in statues, uh, the, the ancient Egyptians used those, uh, those very nicely polished and beautiful color lenses. Uh, those lenses actually have very specific properties uh, because actually there's a color change uh, as you move uh, and observe these, these lenses with different angles. Uh, so they were not used for magnifications, but they were used still for their optical properties. So they were engineered for specific optical properties that represent uh, the true human eye. Uh, back in the Assyrian and Babylonian civilizations, uh, we found traces of actual optical lenses. Uh, very low magnifications for, uh, for the Assyrian, uh, Assyrian lenses, but we know uh, for certain that the, the, the optical lenses that we found in, uh, in Babylon uh, that dates back from the the 8th uh, century uh, BC uh, was actually used for, uh, for ob astronomical observations. Uh, in Greece, uh, around 500 BC, uh, we discovered that then there were actually lenses that were uh, with uh, magnification power up to, to 20, uh, 20 fold. So those magnifications are pretty significant uh, back at that time. Um, it took some time to actually develop optics as a, as a field. Uh, so some of the, the, the earliest work, uh, which is not very known, uh, is actually done in China by uh, Mao Tzu. Uh, so Mao Tzu uh, was a philosopher, uh, but he's done the extensive work on the optics. Uh, he's the first, I want to actually uh, say that light was propagating in straight lines. Uh, talk about reflection, introduce the concept of uh, pinhole, uh, pinhole cameras or uh, uh, camera obscura. Uh, and then uh, this was uh, pre um, preceding the works by the Greeks and the Romans like Euclid and Ptolemy. Uh, there's been significant amount of work also in the in, uh, Persian and Arab uh, uh, worlds. Uh, so the Ibn Sal, uh, for instance, uh, introduced the first theoretical framework for, uh, for refraction. So it's the one who actually discovered uh, the law of refraction uh, before uh, Snell and, and Descartes. Uh, and this uh, mathematical framework uh, served as a basis for uh, a pioneering uh, and massive work by uh, Ibn al uh which was an Arab uh, scientist discussing vision 
uh, and uh, in this in this famous book uh, book of optics. Uh, and then in Europe, uh, there's been also some work by uh, Roger Bacon, for instance, uh, who was uh, uh, an English uh, philosopher. Uh, we had discussed how light was actually behaving and being refracted uh, around uh, spherical containers of water, uh, which were supposed to mimic uh, the human eyeball. Uh, so, of course, um, all of those works, uh, lack of mathematical developments, it was really uh, more geometrical uh, optics, uh, but this serves as the basis of, uh, of modern optics. So modern optics, uh, there's a lot of names that you, uh, you already know. Uh, Jonas Kepler, uh, Galileo, uh, of course, uh, work in the 17th uh, century it was mostly focused on astronomical uh, developments. And, and of course, there's been the, the work by uh, Snellius or Snell, uh, which developed the, the first rigorously mathematically derived uh, laws of refraction, but he did not publish this work uh, and independently uh, René Descartes uh, developed uh, the same laws uh, based on a different approach, and he's published that in uh, in this uh, Dioptrics book. Uh, Christian Huygens, Isaac Newton, uh, also published uh, very uh, closely in time. Passive works, uh, Traité de la Lumière, the Treatise of Light, and, and optics that laid the foundations for for the for modern optics as we know today. A microscope was actually born uh, in 1595, and it was developed by uh, Hans and Zacharias uh, Jensens. Uh, they were father and son. Uh, and then Galileo, uh, just 15 years after, they, uh, improved that first version of the telescope. Uh, so it took some, some time to actually get something which was very, uh, very powerful enough to understand the world around us. But um, Anthony... Van Leeuwenhoek uh, achieved a very high resolution for a microscope uh, in the in the 1670s, uh, and he kept the, the best resolution for for over 100 years. Now moving forward in time, uh, all the way to the 18th and 19th century, uh, we've seen a, an explosion in terms of understanding and, and development of new concepts especially uh, witnessing the birth of a new field, which is diffractive or wave optics. Uh, so this uh, field of wave optics uh, was pioneered by uh, Thomas Young and uh, Augustin Fresnel, uh, and this led to the introduction of new concepts such as uh, light polarization, diffraction of light, and dispersion. So with this, this new concept and this new, uh, new theoretical framework, uh, people have been able to actually develop uh, microscopy techniques uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and in fact, uh, that's been also introducing uh, the concept of diffraction limit. Uh, this concept of diffraction limit has been uh, very important ever since. Uh, and basically it states that the resolution you can achieve with an optical microscope is actually bound by this diffraction limit. So then this is something that was uh, derived uh, independently by uh, Ernst Abbe in 1873 and Lord Rayleigh in 1879. Uh, the numbers that they, they achieve are uh, fairly uh, fairly similar. It's about half the wavelength of optical excitation. So the best resolution you can get, the smallest object uh, you can actually image with light, uh, is given by uh, lambda over 2. There have been a lot of techniques that have been developed over the years to trying to, uh, to, to get better resolution and beat this diffraction limit. So we're going to focus on some of them uh, later on, including the confocal microscopy that we're going to be seeing in Chapter 3. So uh, near-field optics, uh, that's something which is going to be uh, also seen in Chapter 3. Uh, it was actually uh, proposed uh, by Singe in uh, 1928. Uh, so this, uh, this unknown scientist uh, was actually discussing with, uh, with Albert Einstein uh, and sent a letter to Einstein uh, basically discussing some of these ideas. And uh, Einstein uh, came back to him and um, proposed some, some, some improvement and a further refinement of, of the principle of this method. Uh, so this method will allow to, to achieve sub-wavelength limit, and this is something that has been actually achieved experimentally uh, in 1972 uh, by uh, Ash and Nichols, but this was done in a microwave regime. Uh, it took 
12 more years to actually be able to, uh, to achieve sub-wavelength resolution at optical frequencies. Uh, so this work, uh, published in 1984 uh, by Dieter Paul and co-workers, uh, achieved a uh, resolution of the order of lambda over 20. So this is uh, roughly 10 times uh, better than the, the actual uh, optical uh, microscopy techniques which are bound by uh, the diffraction limit. Uh, so we're going to discuss extensively about this near-field optics in Chapter 3. So in the meantime, uh, electromagnetism uh, has also evolved. Uh, we can trace back uh, some of the early, earliest work uh, done by uh, Thales, uh, which is uh, the well-known Greek mathematician. Uh, and actually uh, what he's done is just discover static electricity. Uh, so what he was doing is he was actually rubbing amber uh, against animal fur and realized that uh, this was generating static electricity, and if it was rubbing uh, strong enough, it could actually also observe uh, electric sparks. So on the, on the side note, uh, the, the term uh, electricity comes from the Greek electron, which means amber. So uh, later on, uh, back in, uh, in China, uh, during the, the Qin dynasty, and then later on during the Han dynasty, um, the, the Chinese invented the first uh, magnetic compass. They realized that uh, some materials, uh, they were actually magnetic and they were indicating the, the, the north. Uh, so this is something which was uh, around 200 BC. And then later on, uh, the work of uh, Benjamin Franklin, the famous kite experiment. So in 1750, uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, proposed this, uh, this uh, kite experiment. Uh, so it was a theoretical proposal. Uh, he did not realize the experiments right away. Uh, it's, uh, it's a French scientist, uh, Thomas Dalibar, who actually realized this experiment uh, in 1752. Uh, he was using uh, an actual uh, metallic rod rather than, uh, than a kite. And uh, a couple of months after, Benjamin Franklin realized his own version of the experiment with, uh, with the kite and the key. Uh, so this uh, basically showed that uh, lightning was actually made of electricity, it was just electric discharges. And uh, Benjamin Franklin also, during that time, uh, is the one who introduced the concept of positive and negative charges. And is also uh, the first one to actually introduce the concept of uh, charge conservation. So once uh, we had the, the charges, uh, Charles de Coulomb uh, worked uh, uh, the first fundamental law of electrostatics uh, relating the electric fields uh, with charges, uh, looking at the, the force uh, between uh, similar charges or opposite charges. Uh, so this was the, the first law of, uh, of electrostatics that was developed in 1755, so uh, 33 years after uh, Franklin Skye's experiment. Uh, Poisson uh, also developed some fundamental charges that relates uh, the electric potentials to the, to the actual charge density. Uh, so with this, uh, we have the first fundamental laws of electrostatics, and there's been also some, uh, some work done on magnetostatics, uh, the first pioneering work by uh, Bio and Savard, uh, who developed uh, a law that relates the magnetic fields to the uh, electric current, uh, which serve as, uh, as their source. Uh, so this was done in 1820. So with those uh, pioneering works in electrostatics and, and magnetostatics, um, Gauss came up uh, with the flux theorem and the divert or divergence law. So this was the introduction of more mathematically rigorous uh, theorems and theories. Uh, so he developed this uh, this law to describe the uh, the relationship between electric charges within the surface and the electric field that result from the presence of these charges. Uh, there's been some work by Ampere as well uh, on, the, on the magnetic side, uh, looking at the relationship between magnetic fields uh, and the electric current, uh, and he came up with this uh, circuital law in uh, 1823, so just uh, 10 years after, uh, after Gauss's work. And finally, Michael Faraday uh, came up with this uh, electromagnetic induction theory, uh, same thing uh, less than 10 years after uh, Ampere's work. Uh, so this law uh, predicts how magnetic fields interact with an electric circuit uh, to produce an electromotive force. Uh, so it took the, uh, the genius mind of uh, James Clerk Maxwell 
1861 through 1864 to actually combine all those spine ring works. So, so far, uh, it was believed that electrostatics and magnetostatics were actually two separate ph phenomena, and Maxwell realized uh, very uh, rapidly that, in fact, it was uh, one and the same thing. So he, he came up with this uh, unified theory in this, uh, in this series of work in the, in the early 1860s, and then uh, his uh, final a treatise on electricity and magnetism in 1873. Uh, however, the uh, the equations uh, are not necessarily the one you know today. So these are the actual Maxwell's equations uh, that appear in Maxwell's original paper. So you see that we have a set of equations that we're going to discuss in chapter two. Uh, so you don't recognize them, uh, but you can tr actually transpose them uh, into something which is going to be uh, more modern notations using vector forms. And then you realize that uh, so all those equations, you actually know them uh, from the total and current density, Gauss's law for magnetism, Ampere Maxwell law, Faraday's law, uh, the ele uh, electric elastic continuity, Ohm's law, and Gauss law, and the continuity equation. We took the, the work from Oliver Heaviside in 1884 and 1893 to actually rearrange those equations in the, into the, the four equations we know today. So this is a quick summary of the history of electromagnetism, uh, spanning from the earliest experiments by uh, Franklin and Dalibar in 1752, all the way to uh, the modern reformulation of Max's equations by Oliver Heaviside. So this hundred years of history uh, has led to the uh, significant development of uh, electrostatics and magnetostatics laws. Uh, that ultimately led to this uh, major corner store of electromagnetism, uh, which is the, the work by uh, Maxwell in the early 1860s. So this illustrates very well uh, the famous quote uh, attributed to, to Newton in uh, 1675, that if he has seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, so there's been really a contribution uh, from major people uh, that build upon the previous works, all the way to uh, the ultimate uh, unified theory of uh, electromagnetism by Maxwell. Uh, I want also to uh, to note that um, it's Albert Einstein who actually popularized the, the term Maxwell's equations in 1940. So, uh, what about uh, plasmonics? Uh, some of the pioneering work has been done by Michael Faraday in uh, 1857, where he performed some experiments on uh, colloidal solutions of uh, gold nanoparticles. Uh, I just didn't know that uh, what he was studying at that time uh, was actually plasmons, uh, but he really looked at the optical properties of those gold solutions. Um, Gustav Mie, uh, 1908, uh, developed the first uh, analytical solutions of Maxwell's equations for, for uh, spherical particles. Uh, so this is a theoretical uh, paper, uh, which is very extensive, uh, bringing the, the only uh, analytical solutions of Maxwell's equations. Uh, and in the end, uh, in 1957, uh, Rufus Ritchie, uh, then at uh, Oak Ridge National Lab, uh, wrote a theoretical paper predicting the existence of uh, surface plasmons. Before the birth of plasmonics as a field, uh, gold nanoparticles and silver nanoparticles were actually used in glass to, to provide nice colors. So this is, for instance, uh, two of the uh, famous examples, the Lycurgus cap, uh, which is a Roman cap from the, the 4th century. Uh, then if you illuminate the cap from the outside, it appears green. If you uh, illuminate the cap from the inside in transmission, it appears red. So these uh, properties we're going to be discussing in Chapter 9 are actually due to, uh, to plasmons. Uh, the same for stained glasses. So this is the, the rose window in Notre Dame in Paris and all the different colors uh, are due to the different sizes of uh, gold and silver nanoparticles embedded in the stained glass. Uh, so finally, I wanted to, uh, to finish up with a, a parallel between uh, nanophotonics and uh, electronics. Uh, so similarly to how electronics has evolved from very large table, uh, table size transistors uh, all the way to uh, miniaturized uh, CPUs uh, containing uh, billions of, uh, of transistors. Uh, optics has also uh, seen a, a similar trend going from bulk optical lenses to optical fibers uh, down to uh, nanoscale optical antennas. So there's, uh, there's definitely a technological revolution which is, uh, which is ongoing uh, 
uh, in the field of optics and 